Hello. Um, well, Amare is the head of developer experience at Camunda. And before finding her niche in DevX, she was an enterprise web application developer, right? And you're also passionate about UX, technical communities, both online and offline. And you are very excited to see where advances in AI take us. And I put the very excited, you only said excited, but I hope the very is in place as well. Um, welcome here and um, please take it away. Thank you. I am happy to be here. I mentioned in the chat earlier, my connection was a little choppy, so I hope everyone can, can hear me okay. Um, but let me get my share together here and we can get started. All right, and I see someone said, yes, we can hear you and see you well, fantastic. Um, so like my introduction, my name is Amara Graham. I'm the head of developer experience at Camunda. And today I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey of us um, incorporating AI and docs together. So on today's journey, I'm gonna go through the good, the bad, the ugly, and then wrap up with some talking points for shareholders, or sorry, stakeholders and implementers. Um, but before I kind of move forward, I would love to know in the chat, um, are you at a point where you're evaluating vendors? Are you at a point where you are building your own AI solutions with docs? Are you looking at use cases? Or are you not exploring anything at all? I think I took an assumption that most people or teams are either evaluating vendors or use cases or not exploring anything at all. So that's kind of how I, I tailored my talk. Um, but as I'm kind of talking, I would love to know kind of where you're at in your AI journey. So getting into it, um, I'm gonna tell this story in reverse and to share that we have an AI agent today on docs.comuna.io and it's been really well received both by our developer experience team who owns the implementation and the rest of our um, internal community stakeholders. So that's that's really great, right? We're starting with the good news. Um, we've been running this AI agent since earlier this year, and most people have been really delighted by the experience. And we've actually been able to validate that our docs are good. They're good in the sense that we can see that people are getting the answers that they need, and they're good in the sense that that AI agent responds with the, the correct and accurate information. So all really good things, right? So this is kind of the MVP that I built, and I will admit that it was very iterative in the sense that when we got started with this, and it, I'll talk more about it in the next couple of slides, that we didn't really know what we wanted to do with AI, but we knew we wanted to do something. We knew we wanted to kind of leverage this, this hype or this hype train that I talk about. So I put together four points that I was kind of looking for in our MVP or our initial exploration. So I wanted to be able to cite the sources. And that was really important for me. And I think there was a couple of people who mentioned it in previous talks that these chatbots or these AI agents are not inherently something that people are going to trust off the bat, right? It's not a knowledge worker. It's not a support technician where the, the trust is implied, the expertise is implied. You don't necessarily know where the sources are. You don't necessarily know what's been ingested. So convincing me through citing the sources is kind of like the academic way that I would say um, I like to approach this. Like, show me where you got this information. Where can I go for more information? Uh, the next point, allow for feedback from users, including immediate corrections. This, again, was kind of that reassurance that if it responded incorrectly or strange or to the most extreme, a hallucination, could I, as a user or a maintainer of this tool, give it feedback to say, this is not, this is not quite right? And then the last two are more specific to, to me and my team. We want something that was low effort to implement and maintain, and it also had to impress me. Um, I'm a former AI advocate, so I know quite a bit about this space, got in very early with uh, machine learning. So convincing me that this was safe, low risk, all of that jazz was, was gonna be really important. So how are we using AI and docs today? 
We use Kappa AI, which I saw had a, a sponsored talk, although unfortunately I couldn't hear Emil uh, because it was a little bit too early for me. I was still sleeping. Um, but we use Kappa AI to power our AI agent that's ingested the docs, the forum, and then select company web pages. Uh, we partner with the rest of the company, so with the rest of Kamunda, to improve our sources for accuracy, clarity, and quality using the AI for testing. Um, we can see what questions internal community and external community members or customers are asking. And I think this became really important as I was looking around internally for people who were interested in AI, interested in what we were doing with it, and kind of helping them understand the, the value that they could see very early on. It was that user touch point that we were kind of missing in the process. So I have three bullet points here around kind of the, the very high level way that we're using it. So ingesting a variety of, of knowledge bases, I mentioned docs, the forum, um, and then select company web pages, measuring and monitoring engagement and enablement, um, and then continuous improvement. So being able to see those conversations that people are asking, and then being able to see, do we need to clarify any topics or any features to help users get clarity of how to use those features more quickly? The other really important thing here um, is the answers the AI agent provides are really conservative and they're constrained to the ingested domain knowledge. I know that there's other speakers who have mentioned, you know, kind of the, the really bad side of, of AI where it's like, well, could someone, you know, hijack your, your model or could someone, you know, ask really weird questions and get really weird answers and maybe do some adversarial training type things. Um, the, the way that our implementation works is very specific to, to Kamunda, and it is kind of fun to watch people um, on the back end dashboard try to ask it questions that are outside of that domain knowledge. But one of the most important things for me was that the AI agent is okay with saying, I don't know. And this, I think, goes back to that like trust aspect that I was mentioning, where if I'm working with somebody in like a support agent context and they say, I don't know, or I need to go get more information for you, I'm you know, willing to admit that they're human at that point. Of course they are, um, or hopefully they are. And I'm okay with them not being a complete expert in the domain. I'm okay with someone saying, you know, hey, I need to escalate this to my supervisor or pull someone else in. But when I'm working with a chat bot um, or an AI agent, I don't know what the domain expertise is. And I'd be willing to take everything that they're telling me at face value. Everything is like, okay, yes, this is correct. This is accurate. This is precise. And we're still in that point of our, our overall AI journey as an industry where we do have the risk of hallucination. We do have the risk of something being not quite correct. And so having an implementation that says, I don't know, is, is really powerful. And it's something that we can kind of flag and track and go and improve as the, the maintainers of this tool. So again, I wasn't here earlier for um, Emil's talk. I don't know if he shared anything about what Kappa looks like, but I wanted to share this screenshot that shows um, a couple weeks ago, the number of questions that we're looking at coming into our, our AI agent and then the response certainty. So it's kind of difficult to see potentially, but you can see the uncertain responses there is that tiny little gray on the, the bottom chart. Um, this is really great because um, it's showing that our uncertain responses are quite low. Um, I probably won't take action until we see double digits here. And I um, actually logged into the tool this morning and saw that we had a week of 0% response uncertainty. So that's really, really fantastic to see as well. Um, but this is kind of the validation that I was talking about. More certain responses tell us a few things. Either the questions have clear answers or the docs provide good source material or both. Um, so this is one of those improvement metrics that we can, can look at and kind of not necessarily try to game, but make sure that if we go through the other uh, UIs within the tool, we can see what questions are uncertain, drill into those and try to, to understand why were they uncertain and how do we get them to be more certain. So now I kind of want to cover the, the bad. Um, so we talked about the good thing, talked about how things are working, things are working well, um, but let's kind of take a step back. So when we started this 
implementation, I was receiving a ton of inbound messages from companies and individuals pitching their generative AI solutions. Hey, look at our LLM, we'll help you build one. Many were really immature. And I do want to say that this was early in the year, late last year, when I was having a lot of these inbound messages come to me. And a lot of them looked really sketchy. And I think we've seen this before with new areas of, of tech, where people are so eager to get started and so eager to kind of get their name or their solution there that they go and they don't do things like proofread their website. Um, so for me, it looks really, really sketchy. And I'm kind of risk adverse in that sense, like, oh, I'm interested, but I'm not so interested as like, I'll let this company steal my PII, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we wanted to move quickly on an AI application, but we weren't exactly sure what that meant. Um, so John, one of us earlier mentioned, you know, that you have competitors and point solutions that were created daily. And I strongly believe this is what was driving that, that cycle and what I was kind of caught in, where every time we, we looked at a new vendor or we looked to see what kind of solution we wanted to build with, with AI or documentation, we were met with, you know, 10 brand new things and people internally messaging me and saying, hey, I heard about this company. Have you heard about that? Um, so there was there was a lot going on there and a lot of noise. But the other thing was it was difficult for us to determine a success criteria. What did it really mean to be a good solution in this space or a good vendor experience? Um, were we customer one? Did someone else take the risk first? Could we see what their implementation or their experience looked like? So we had an initial POC going um, led by Stephen Hicks on my team. And we were initially quite worried that our docs just weren't parsable by an LLM. Um, and I'll go more into that on the, the next slide. But this is where I wanted to mention if there's any folks from like the community management space who had the opportunity, let's say, to run a community forum, know the chaos that exists there. People ask ill-formed questions, questions go unanswered for many reasons, questions aren't always marked as answered, or answers aren't always valid, accurate, precise, on and on. Like docs, we would expect them to be valid, precise, maintained. Um, so when I say, you know, the bad is the forum as a data source, are you kidding me? That comes with a lot of anxiety from some people, particularly me as a former community manager. And then of course we have the industry horror stories of what is it hallucinating? What is it coming up with? And how is it convincing our users of um, something that's not true? So how to combat this, I would say quickly identify champions and converts internally. So the people who are excited about AI or excited about the particular POC that you have running, and then encourage some of those naysayers to get hands on. And I completely acknowledge in some cases, this was also myself. So as I'm getting all these inbound messages, I'm doing kind of little testing and, and validation here and there. Um, but I needed to get hands on as well to kind of convince myself that this was the space that I wanted to move forward in. Now to the ugly. Um, we were suddenly faced with Altons in our closet. So we were asking ourselves, you know, what makes a good answer or better yet, what makes good source material? Um, so Steven, again, on my team who was running this POC, did a survey internally with questions and answers um, and basically asked willing engineers, could they provide feedback on, you know, if they were asked this question, were these answers or these responses complete, accurate, precise? Um, and many of the answers that we were getting back from our very initial POCs with a number of different vendors just weren't good. Um, and I'm not gonna name shame, that's not what I'm here for. But it gave us kind of that reality check of like, okay, if these answers aren't good or they're not good engineers to stand up and say like, yeah, this looks this looks good, we need to be really cautious here. And um, it helped us kind of set some of those MVP items that I mentioned earlier, where if we didn't have a vendor that was giving us a source or if we didn't have a solution that was giving us the, the source cited in the answer, we were a little bit reluctant to move forward with it because if we were going to use this tool to improve our source material, in this case, the docs, um, where are we going to find that? We were going to have to dig and do a lot of manual work on our own. 
So the the ugly was was really ugly, and we were skeptical that we made the right choices in docs. Um, and some of this came from things like how our pages were were structured. The names of our our product um, was a, a a big issue. We have Kamun to seven and Kamun to eight, and they're technically two different products, not two different versions. And so there was things that we were running up against that we as the the developer experience team didn't maintain. Um, but had to, to work around. So this is where I say know when to pivot. So again, I'm not going to name shame previous vendors or tools that we we tried, but this was a really good um, way for us to say, you know, hey, if this, this was responding in a way that we thought was uncomfortable or weird, let's try another one and let's see how it responds. And if it responds well, then that's great. Um, we'll continue moving forward. Or if we hit one of those milestones where we're like, you know, this is a really intuitive answer, or this should be an intuitive answer based on, you know, how we're reading through the docs and how we understand how this works, then let's let's just try a different solution because there were so many that were out there. Um, and again, going back to that MVP slide I mentioned, it needed to be something that was easy to, to implement, kind of just slide in. So we were looking for mostly a, a maintained service and not something that we would have to, to build and generate on our own. So to kind of wrap up here, because again, I'm, I'm assuming that many of the people listening are kind of very early in their own AI and, and docs journeys. Um, I put together kind of two things to kind of guide your conversations. Um, so when you're talking to your stakeholders, I think it's really important for them to understand um, not just that a, an AI agent or an LLM is not going to, you know, suddenly write the docs themselves and take over the, the technical writing space, um, but they enforce good docs behavior and, and hygiene. If it's not parsable by a machine, with some exceptions, right? We heard earlier things like tabs and stuff are maybe not so good, but if it's not parsable by a machine, it's probably not going to be parsable by a human either. So thinking about that in terms of, you know, do you have time set up to go back and maintain and kind of prune and garden your docs? Um, LLMs are going to force you to do that because they're going to, to respond with the information that's there and probably uncover some of the things where you're like, oh, I thought that might be a problem. And now we're there and it is one. Um, using the AI agent's source, um, actual user questions. So that, that direct touch pointers is so difficult to get these days unless people are fully bought into providing feedback. We know that people don't really love answering surveys. We know people don't really love kind of having that, that conversation um, to talk about you know, their experience with the product unless you really bribe them. And if you're talking about the developer persona, it's even more difficult. So having those, those actual questions that people are, are asking is super, super valuable. And then on the, the support side, reducing the how do I questions is always um, going to help your support team kind of lessen their load. For the implementers, this kind of goes back to the MVP thing that I mentioned at the beginning. Design a set of questions um, and potentially even sources that you want to, to ingest and test it against those, see how it responds. Um, take calculated and inform risks. It may hallucinate. It may, you know, hallucinate in a good way. <laughs> you can even call it that. Um, but but be really careful and be really specific about what you're you're willing to allow there. And then lastly, commit to evaluating and reviewing the metrics. So I didn't go into a whole lot of this other than those uncertain questions. Um, but I think this is is really big for getting the most out of an, an AI agent like this on your docs. And with that, uh, you can follow me in a bunch of different spaces, but I'll also hang out um, and answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Amara, for your for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> there are a few questions in the in the chat, not so many. Um, one of them is how many developers or users are creating those six hundred questions a week. That's a very good question. Um, I 
don't know exactly how many. Um, we know we have a, a large customer base and we know that we have both internal and external users. So the best answer that I could give you is like a couple hundred, couple thousand, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you so much.